Okay, I think we can get started and then if you know people trickle in, no worries. So good morning, everyone. Happy to see y'all here today for our fourth ideas workshop. Um, before we jump in today, Cindy, if you wouldn't mind putting that link in the chat, um, we uh, would love to invite you to use the contact info survey that is being plopped in the chat. If you'd like to share your contact info with us so that we can keep in touch with y'all and share relevant resources, feel free to fill that info out. Okay. So today we are going to be talking about marketing and outreach. We're going to focus on developing a study abroad marketing and outreach plan for historically marginalized students that fit the needs of your institutional contexts today. Let's start with our land acknowledgement. We invite you to acknowledge and reflect on the histories of dispossession and forced removal that have allowed for the growth and survival of the United States and our institutions of higher education. As people on occupied territories, we must acknowledge the land, the ancestors who have cared for this land since time immemorial and all of our native and indigenous connections today. In light of these histories, we have a responsibility to take active efforts to partner with native and indigenous community members and neighbors to seek justice as we continue our work together as a community of learners, leaders, and educators. So here's our schedule for today. We'll start with an opening activity, then move into our interactive presentation, have a short break, go into a critique of the marketing materials that we're gonna provide for y'all, have a Q&A and a share out, and then our closing and assignment of tasks. So let's get into some breakout rooms to discuss the marketing material homework that you all were tasks to bring with you today. Um, as a reminder, that homework was asking for you to look for materials that directly speak to a group of students that are historically marginalized in study abroad at your organization or your institution. If y'all didn't have a chance to do that, no worries. I imagine you have um, a lot of examples, you know, front of mind um, from previous experiences. But what we'd like you to do in the breakout room is share key components um, that resonated with you and then discuss how these can be incorporated into marketing and outreach efforts. So we'll be in our rooms for about 10 minutes and then we'll come back together and ask individuals from uh, a couple of groups to share themes with us. All right, so Cindy, if you wouldn't mind plopping everybody into rooms and we will see y'all back here in about 10 minutes. So we'd love to hear what y'all talked about in your breakout groups. Maybe if you wanna share either in the chat or unmute yourself, you don't have to feel like you need to raise your hand. Um, you can share what historically marginalized group your marketing material was created to support. You can share if you had any new, if you've got any new ideas about how you might wanna move forward with a certain aspect of marketing in your office from the discussion, or um, if there's anything else that resonated with you. Ooh, what is, um, yes. <laughs> so my, I work in the study abroad program within diversity office at IU Bloomington. It's a one person office, but I have, um, I support about 6,000 students through diff three different scholarship programs. And we have funding, um, study abroad scholarship, and then also we create customized study abroad programs and really targeting first time study abroad students. And then after end of the program, we create this photo book online because I think instead of explaining, this is what we do, this is how we do, this is who helped us, blah, blah, blah. Um, it's just easy to just put a bunch of pictures together and kind of highlighting the course content at very high level. And I think that intrigues the, you know, that when students look at that, I think they get excited that they could be that in the next year or two, right? So, um, of course, we couldn't run anything since 2020 and 2021. And then currently we have one program in Mexico City that's running right now. So, 
Um, but it also in, in the fall, we hosted study abroad photo contest. And I think that was, that was pretty cool too. And we print out, um, we've done like a different photo exhibitions or just the collages that we printed and put it in our office. So I think just look at using a lot of pictures and when students look at pictures and they, you know, somehow can either relate, they look like them, the group looks diverse, the faculty looks diverse. I think that's very um, promising. Exactly, representation. Thank you so much for sharing. This photo book idea is so interesting and the link, I'm, I'm looking at it right now. May I ask a follow-up? How are students accessing this? Like, is this linked on your website? Yeah, okay. yeah. so on our website, we have um, like, this is the study abroad programs that my office runs and then visit the previous books, you know, things like that, so. Thank you so much for sharing. What a great idea. Others that want to share, you know, anything else that resonated with them, maybe some ideas that they got or um, more about the, the specific group of students that you're targeting your research, or excuse me, your outreach. And I will repost the link, Christy, sure. Go ahead, Gabriella, please. Yes. So in our group, we, a couple of us service minority serving institutions that are very pre predominantly minorities. So most of our students are underrepresented. So we don't specifically target a group, uh, not always. Um, but I, if I can share one of the flyers that I have, uh, let me see if I can share my screen. Let me make sure you have access to do that. Yeah, you, you just have to stop yours, Courtney. Sure. All right. Can you all see my screen? Wonderful. So I couldn't find many materials in advance uh, to prepare for today, but this is one of the flyers for our info sessions for the TRIO program uh, on campus. And the pictures that are on the flyer are from our students abroad. And then the picture of the Coliseum, I believe it was taken by a student, but I am not 100%. Uh, but we try to use the students on the materials as much as possible. Like I mentioned to my colleagues, sometimes there is so much information that has to go on on, on the flyer or the marketing post that we don't have that much space for, for pictures. And then other pictures from the students are not always uh, very serious. So we also encounter that risk. And may I ask something that I think about a lot in my office is, I know students are taking pictures. How do we get them? Uh, how do you get your pictures? So we have a email where they can email the pictures back and we ask them to do so. Now, I started at Miami Dade College right before the pandemic. So no students have traveled while I've been in charge, but we do have um, a good relationship with them and, and we follow up and we ask them to please send the pictures. And also the faculty collect the pictures from them sometimes. And that makes it easier for the faculty to, they have that relationship. Some of our faculty have WhatsApp groups with the students. So they get the pictures through there. Those don't end up always being the best quality, but it still helps. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. Yes, I've also found that faculty can be really great allies and in, in <laughs> picture hunting. They are. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you. Does anyone else feel compelled to share before we move on? Courtney, I wanted to add. Please. Um, in, in um, something that we've employed in, in trying to get students to share their photos with us um, and telling them that they are helping us change the face of study abroad. 
Um, students are more inclined to study abroad when they see students who look like them, as you all have said. And so we reach out to them and ask them to help us do that. And the only way that we can do that is by having your photographs and sharing them um, with your peers. Um, and so just, it, I think if I make a, com a compelling argument or a, com a compelling request from them, they'll be more inclined to share. And we've gotten so many wonderful photos of students, diverse, all types of students uh, on the programs abroad. Amazing. Yes. I think that's so important to remind students that you you have the power to help change this um, narrative, right? Exactly. Thank you. Um, okay. I am going to share my screen again. If I can. Yes. Everybody can see my screen now. Okay. Wonderful. So we are about to move into our interactive presentation portion. Um, Cindy, would you mind please um, making the Zoom poll live. Before we start, y'all, please let us know what you're hoping to learn today. This can be broad, this can be specific, whatever y'all want to share. We just want to get a better sense of how we can support y'all today. How do we reach students if they don't read email? Whew. Yes. I think that relates to a lot of this best platforms. I hear one of the things we're going to get at later is creating marketing materials when we not all of us are marketing gurus or have experience with marketing, but we're, yet we're tasked to do this. Um, and I agree, this third uh, bullet here, love hearing about what is working well with others. I mean, the point of this today is to share and um, collaborate and hopefully get walk away with some specific ideas that you've learned from someone else. So. Thank you all. Um, Cindy has kindly copied our goals in the chat for those of you who want to continue to read. And um, I think I just need to share my screen again. Get started. Thank you. Okay. So, Megan, if you want to take it away. Thank you, Courtney. Hi, everybody. My name is Megan Swanson. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a program manager and study abroad coordinator at Green River College, which is a community college near Seattle, Washington. You can see some facts and figures there about our demographic and um, students who study abroad, but we are a minority serving institution for Asian American and Native American Pacific Islander students, also called Anabizi. About 33% of our students qualify for need-based financial aid, 25% are first generation, and 59% identify as students of color. Um, at Green River, we have a one and a half person office, so I've got one part-time person who supports me with our study abroad marketing efforts. And in addition, we belong to a statewide consortium for study abroad um, with 17 different community colleges. And together, we pool our students to go on um, one or two programs a quarter. And Jema, who is a fellow presenter today, is also a member of that consortium. Um, so I think we can go on to the next slide, please. Thank you. So some of the strategies I found that work well, again, thinking that we're a community college, we only have two years to capture and market to our students before they move on. So starting early as possible, uh, as far as they're in high school with sophomores who are coming to visit our campus to just check out Green River for the first time. We've uh, partnered with the college outreach team and so finally, they've started inviting us to come to those visit sessions and we get a 10 minute window to present about studying abroad. And we know not all of them are coming to Green River, so we try to make it general enough just to help them learn about the benefits, but maybe it'll attract them to come. I have actually uh, last year had a student apply for one of our programs and she said I came to Green River specifically because of a presentation you did at our high school a year ago and I wanted to go there so I felt that was a great success so we're trying to do more of that high school outreach 
Um, also, we have a running start program in Washington State, which allows students to finish their high school diploma and their AA degree at the same time. So running start has been gracious enough to include a bit about study abroad in their orientation for all new running start students. And as you know, their parents are also present in the room at that time. So that's a great um, audience to capture. Secondly, um, we are partnering with our financial aid office. A while back, we decided to put some FAQs and a, a how-to video on our website on just how do you use financial aid to study abroad. And in that process of developing the FAQs, we realized there were too many steps. We were sending students back and forth between our two offices to get information and share information. So we said, let's remove that step and on the back end we created a SharePoint site where I upload the budget estimate sheets for all of our programs and the financial aid director can access those. She's also created a, a form for students asking them, you know, do you give me permission to share your financial situation, your um, estimated award with study abroad? And so if they consent, then we could actually just have a joint meeting right then and there. This is Duke, hello. Uh, and um, let's see, third is uh, scholarship writing workshops. So a big concern for all students and especially community college students is how am I gonna pay for it? Are there scholarships available? So it's one thing to tell them yes, and here's the links, but it's another to help them and coach them on writing a strong application. So we partnered with our writing center um, which usually helps students, you know, with their English essays, but they were happy to come along and um, do a joint session with us and give students tips. Um, and they're also happy for students to come in and bring their study abroad essays to the writing center. Um, we also have a, a United Way funded benefits hub, and they provide students with general budgeting support. So um, we invited them as well to be a part of that workshop. Um, along with a Gilman ambassador from our region. So it, um, it was a very collaborative effort and um, we're hoping to start doing that on a quarterly basis from now on. So those are my top tips and um, I'll pass it on to the next person. Thank you so much, Megan. Um, my name is Kendall Cox. My pronouns are he, him, his, um, and I am the Director of Alumni Engagement uh, as well as the assistant director um, of our Frederick Douglass Global Programs at CIEE. Um, and in my work, I work to uh, support students after they have returned from their programs abroad uh, to help them hopefully leverage uh, their time abroad to advance the remainder of their time in college and then uh, hopefully um, in their eventual career. Um, and CIE, I'm pretty sure most of you are familiar with CIE, but we support uh, many students on varying programs around the world. Um, we are one of the largest sponsors of inbound uh, degree work visas in the country, and we also have numerous programs abroad. Uh, so we are sending lots of students abroad and also working with thousands of students uh, who are coming into the United States as well. But one of our hallmark programs that I've worked with um, is the Frederick Douglass Global Fellowship, um, which is more relevant to our session today. Um, and on that program, we take 16 high performing students of color uh, to Ireland for a month to learn about advocating for positive change, conflict resolution, um, and really within the spirit of Frederick Douglass and his legacy and the time that he spent in Ireland um, as a runaway slave. Uh, and, and that program has really started to uh, increase access for diverse students. Um, so any student who applies to that fellowship um, and is not selected to be one of the 16 receives a $1,500 scholarship uh, to study abroad on any one of our programs around the world. Um, so hopefully students who wouldn't traditionally study abroad have the opportunity to see the world. Um, and we have an expansive marketing department that supports the organization in our uh, varying um, business lines. So if we want to, if we can move to the next. Um, so some strategies that we employ in particular with regard to the Frederick Douglass Global Fellowship and reaching diverse students um, is to collaborate with DEI and fellowship and career service offices to encourage them to spread the word about the fellowship. I've said at many a conference, as I'm sure many of you have or talked in your office about how do we get to 
to the diverse students. Where are they? They're not coming in the office. They don't think study abroad is for them. How do we get to them? So with this fellowship, we really try to collaborate with our partners in the study abroad office and reaching out to their diversity offices because those offices know where the students are. They know the organizations that those students are a part of and have inroads and in being able to connect with them. I mean, we've seen incredible success with doing that. Um, and so we really just try to tap into those groups and encourage them um, uh, to study abroad. We've also created uh, postcards that we send to um, our partners in, in those offices. So for the Douglas Fellowship, it's almost like a two-pronged marketing. We have to reach the students, but then we also have to reach um, the people in the diversity offices, in the fellowship offices, in the study abroad offices to get that fellowship on their radar and encourage them um, and their students to apply. So we always like to follow up with them um, with physical things to remind them. So not only are they getting email blasts from us, but they're also getting things surprising in the mail um, to remind them about the fellowship. So sometimes I know we try to lean away from paper and all of those things and try to be more sustainable, but sometimes where we can, we like to do that to continue to engage with our partners. Um, and another thing that we do is we develop a university specific branding and we try to link our brand with the university uh, where we can because we all know study abroad is an alphabet soup of acronyms of different organizations that are just letters um, and so where we can we know students know their university they know their university's brand and if we can partner with them and link uh, those brands together they know that we are a trusted partner of the institution and they know uh, that and they know that they are participating on a quality program. Uh, so, so those are some of the things that, that we've employed at CIE. Hi, my name is Jama Kuhlman. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the Director of Educational Planning at Wenatchee Valley College in Wenatchee, Washington. Um, my team and I coordinate placement and we do advising for all new incoming students. Um, but I wear a few different hats here, and one of those is a study abroad coordinator. WVC is a small community college. We're located in central Washington, and we serve a very wide uh, geographical area, uh, large ed, uh, agricultural focus here. Like many institutions, our enrollment is currently lower than it has been in the past right now. Um, we have a large population of Latinx students here, uh, and we have several grant programs operating on campus, including CAMP and TRIO that are designed specifically to serve either Latinx, uh, low income, or uh, and or first generation students. Because we are a small community college, uh, it would be difficult for us to run our own standalone study abroad program. So we've partnered with WICSA, the Washington State Community College Consortium for Study Abroad that me uh, Megan mentioned earlier. WICSA allows us to offer a variety of study abroad programs to our students that we wouldn't be able to uh, do on our own. And, and um, study abroad is a new concept for many of the students um, here at WVC. Um, next slide. Uh, my first strategy to share uh, to recommend is uh, to go wide because of limited resources. I, I partner with my community relations department for a broader reach. Uh, they have a larger following on social platforms and have accounts on more social media platforms. In the past, if I have something especially newsworthy to share, uh, they have helped develop a press release and share that out with local uh, news networks, including our local newspaper and radio stations. Uh, they'll also uh, do uh, translate flyers for us if needed um, into Spanish. Um, they've recently begun using geofencing to assist with some advertising and marketing campaigns for the college, which has the potential to reach a larger audience with a more targeted message. I haven't tapped into that yet, um, but I'm hoping to use, uh, use that in the future. If you're unfamiliar with geofencing, there is a link in the workshop uh, materials to a Wikipedia article um, kind of talks about that um, topic. Going in the opposite direction, I also work to partner with specific groups um, and clubs on campus to promote directly to their students. Uh, you might think about the different clubs or grant programs on your campus that serve a specific demographic you'd especially like to reach. Could you attend their meetings? Could you provide um, flyers or email content to their program staff to share out with their students? 
I try to connect regularly with our high school age Running Start students, as well as the camp and TRIO grant students and staff. I'm also looking for other ways to reach out to some of our underrepresented areas, such as our um, allied health students through their clubs and, and instructors, as well as our coaches and student athletes. And we have a new STEM grant program for underrepresented students that I'm hoping to work with in the future as well. Finally, um, sometimes doing things the old fashioned way can get attention these days. You might consider doing a snail mail letter or an invitation to students' homes, personally inviting them and their parents or partners to uh, the next information session or event that you're offering. Unlike an email, this has the added benefit of possibly being seen by your student's support system at home who may give them the extra encouragement they need to take a chance on study abroad. Um, I work with my registrar and institutional research office to obtain a list of currently enrolled students based on different criteria, GPA, credits completed, student type, et cetera. And I um, have sent them a letter uh, kind of praising their accomplishments and their hard work, uh, academic progress, and invite them and their parents or partners to attend an information session to learn more. That said, I still usually follow up with a text message too uh, to cover my basis. We have a new text messaging system that we're using. So for those concerns about emails not being read, we, we are seeing a little bit better response with text messaging. So if your college has that ability and can plug into that resource, um, seem to get a little, little bit better response there. Courtney. Thank, thank you, you, Jima. Just was jotting down some more ideas. <laughs> okay, everybody. So hi again, I'm Courtney. I am the study abroad manager at the University of Washington Tacoma. I use she, her, hers pronouns. Um, as stated in session two, our student population at UWT is quite diverse, and our study abroad population is generally representative of that student population, as you can see from the, the data points below. Um, what's most important to remember for me is that many UWT students haven't considered studying abroad at all. They don't know anyone who has studied abroad. They don't even really know what it means. So we do a lot of work trying to help students understand what it is, why it's important, and how they can overcome perceived barriers. Um, I'll also just say that we do not have a specialized marketing staff member in our office. I couldn't do the work I do without the student employees and without Canva. Um, so, Let's see, here are some strategies that we use. Um, someone earlier in the chat mentioned that they are doing like a myth busting session. I can't remember who said that, but this is actually a, a um, flyer on the right hand side of the page of a similar session that we started this quarter with our Center for Equity and Inclusion for a group of students of, of RISE scholars who are first year uh, students of color. And it's basically the same. It's a fact check where we try to share with students um, that there are misconceptions on campus, uh, but that some of those misconceptions are actually myths or um, barriers where we can actually really help them find resources to overcome those barriers. So that's just a side note. So let's get to these strategies. Um, class visits. So after analyzing data, we realized that most of our students find out about study abroad from their professors. So for the past free, uh, few years, I've been reaching out to faculty to ask them if I can come into their class and do a quick 10 minute presentation about what study abroad is, why it's important, options, and then how students can get started. I've normally been doing about 25 to 30 class visits in autumn quarter, which helps prepare um, for our January and February application deadlines. It's really helped get the word out and it encourages a lot of buy-in from faculty as well. So they'll post to like their Canvas sites. And during these visits, we use like an old school method of just having interested students put their name and email address on a piece of paper, which we then uh, manually sign them up for our newsletter. So pre-COVID, I was actually generally able to get 50 to 100 new students to sign up uh, you know, during autumn quarter, which is a lot for our student population, and it really helped get the word out and again start dispelling some of these um, these myths. 
Secondly, we try to do a lot of identity specific info sessions. We partner with first gen fellows with our veteran and military resource center, disability resource center and the center for equity and inclusion. And I tailor the session info slightly to the demographic of students that we're working with. I share data about those students and then invite a staff member from that office to come along and share resources that help reduce barriers. So for instance, if we're with the Disability Resource Center, we talk about accommodations that students could have while they're abroad. If we're with the Veteran and Military Resource Center, we talk about how students can use um, GI Bill, et cetera, to help pay for their study abroad program. We do walk-in advising, and this is a little bit of a long game approach. Um, <laughs> because we don't see a ton of foot traffic, I will say that, but we um, have done this advising for a long time in our Center for Equity and Inclusion, and we've built relationships with the students who work there, who many, many of whom actually have ended up studying abroad, and then by us being there, they are more aware of study abroad options, and they can share this information with other students who just happen to come through the center, you know, whenever. Um, we have a student worker actually host these walk-in hours on a weekly basis. Um, we also have tried really hard to get more content, video content from our students specifically. So this day in the life video content, um, we are able to offer a scholarship through our office. And part of the deal when students <laughs> accept the funding is that they are required to send me videos, photos, um, and what I started doing in 2019, just before COVID, was asking students to choose a day while they're abroad and videotape themselves doing like 30 seconds of things throughout the day. So eight to 10 quick snippets of here's what I do for my breakfast and here's me on the tram and here's me in class and here's me you know, at the market. And then we as an office post the, uh, paste those together and create what we call a day in the life video. So students can really see what study abroad actually is about. Um, and then finally, we have used focus groups. So for instance, when updating our study abroad brochure, um, we did a focus group with student employees again at the Center for Equity and Inclusion, and their feedback gave us insight into what to include and remove from our brochure, how to change language so it was more approachable and more accessible, again, for those students who don't even know what study abroad is. So with all of that said, um, Cindy, if you wouldn't mind initiating the Zoom poll again, the Zoom poll at the bottom of the screen says, what strategies are we missing? please share one marketing or outreach strategy that you use that you think would be helpful to the group, please. And I'll give you a couple minutes to do this. Wow, so many ideas here. Um, I saw Instagram takeover. That's something that we've been trying to do in my office with some success and then we're keeping those recorded and putting them on the website for students who couldn't actually attend. Great idea. I see a lot of like using students, right? Using alums to help spread the word students with disabilities, I'm assuming that means, you know, working with those particular students to spread the word about their study abroad experiences or, um, you know, with a, with a disability. Zoom panels, yes. I think there's some chatter in the, the chat about getting permission from students. Some great examples here about how we can get permission from students to make sure that, you know, they give us their permission to use the videos and the photos. Um, thank you. So everyone, if you have questions about that, there's a lot of information in the chat about that. Thanks, y'all. Gosh, I was frantically writing ideas down again um, on my paper here. So I'm just so excited to share some of these ideas with colleagues. And I saw several people uh, talk about launching this, this course, or maybe it was just Shannon. Shannon, um, that is something that I'm personally interested in. Do you have do you have anything else that you want to share about how you were able to do this? <laughs> sure. Um, good morning, all. Um, I'm from UC Riverside in Southern California, and this has been an ongoing process the last couple of years. Um, and really, we, we had a graduate student assistant for a little while, and so this was started to be her project of looking at what the course could be. Um, and she worked with our faculty um, director and went through, you know, put together the proposal for a 10 week course, one credit through um, our global studies department. 
um, which serendipitously, they were also going through a process of thinking about requiring learning abroad for their major, which wasn't a requirement before. Um, and so we kind of had perfect timing there. Um, and they helped shepherd it through the Academic Senate and our staff in the Education Abroad Office will be assisting with the majority of the content because the focus is a, it's a one credit course. Each week we'll focus on kind of going through the process, applying for scholarships, what, is, you know, what does it look like? Um, and then there's also a strong focus on career connections. So getting the students in the course already thinking about how they can use their international experience in their post post learning abroad life. So whether that's applying for internships in interviews, um, putting it on their resume, creating materials that they can share as part of their portfolio, um, all of that is wrapped up in this 10 week course. Wonderful, thank you so much for sharing. Um, I'm jealous and excited for you. I'd love to learn more about how it goes. Um, all right, everyone. Again, there's so much information here. And like Cindy said, we'll, we will be sharing all of this with you. So when you have some time, come back and sift through to get more ideas. Um, let's take a moment to reflect. Um, this reflection is for you. You are not going to be sharing out here. Uh, it's just a, a place for us to sort of reset and think about the next portion of this presentation. So take a moment to reflect on a mistake that you've made when doing outreach for study abroad. Replay that mistake in your head and then think about what you learned from it. How did you adapt after the situation? How did you change your marketing or outreach strategy after you learned from that experience? Okay, so now that we've got that reflection point right at the front of our brain here. Let's move into the next portion of the presentation where we share some of the mistakes, the mistakes excuse me, we've made and what we've learned for, uh, from them. Take it away. Is that me, Courtney? Sorry, yes. <laughs> All right, hey everybody again. So um, the biggest mistake that um, I can reflect on and wanted to share with you all today is we were launching a new program in a new destination we've never gone to before. And when we chose the featured image for the primary poster and brochure, we failed to vet that photo with members of the host community. So while it looked attractive and fairly innocuous to the outside viewer, we didn't know that in the background it included disputed indigenous land that was pretty much only accessible to tourists. So this turned out to be quite hurtful to the host community that we were trying you know, to build a positive and new relationship with. So we learned a lot from that experience. Um, but the main takeaway for me was that even if you think you're sure about your content, it's always best to have somebody else review it. Ideally, someone who's local to that community or with direct ties to the host environment. Um, you, could, you may even have students who attend your college who you could connect with, if not your partners abroad. Um, or in the host location. So we're a lot more thoughtful about the content of our, of our photos and we consider not only representation of who's being shown, but also the cultural appropriateness and setting that you're featuring. So that's um, my lesson learned. And I think Jama is gonna share next. Thank you, Megan. Um, yeah, I have a few do's and don'ts that I've learned. Um, Sometime, uh, something I, I tried um, early on was setting up a table to staff in a high traffic air, area on campus in order to share study abroad flyers and brochures and answer questions, but I never really saw a lot of traffic. Um, there was a little rush between classes, but otherwise it was pretty slow. So this may sound kind of kind of basic, but I found that if I paired my tabling with other events happening on campus, I had better attendance. Um, and more meaningful interactions with the students um, participating. Plus a lot of the promotion was done for me. So I reached a wider, a wider audience uh, doing that. I usually have a table set up at our annual uh, club day and at uh, international day events and other things happening on campus. 
If possible, I try to have a former study abroad student help staff the table with me. So um, one of my takeaways would be, you know, don't don't go it alone. Try to try to partner uh, partner up whenever possible. Uh, another lesson is that in the past, when I have emailed material to faculty or recruiters to share out, sometimes I'd learn later that some didn't share uh, or, or didn't print or share the material out to uh, at, at their event or with their students. Instead, I now try to provide the pr promotional material uh, for others to share. I give stacks of flyers um, and swag, if I have it, uh, to our college recruiters, uh, to clubs and other student groups and to faculty. That way they can help me reach a more uh, diverse group of students. Uh, our college recruiters especially like having uh, colorful study abroad uh, flyers and fun swag to attract students to their tables at the local high schools and community events that, that they're part of. So I recommend that you um, provide your own materials whenever possible. Thanks, Jamie. Kendall? Yeah, so uh, for us, we've definitely made some mistakes in creating graphics, um, marketing materials for our students. Um, especially for the for the Douglas Fellowship. And, and one of the mistakes that we were making um, was that we were creating graphics that we internally as an organization understood, um, but our partners and, and students might not because uh, they didn't have institutional knowledge. Like we just kind of assumed people would know. Um, and so for example, we would create uh, flyers that would have acronyms or internal language that wasn't defined um, or um, or we would make we would make flyers that didn't necessarily have all of the information. So we sent out a flyer to for the application launch of the Douglas Fellowship, and it didn't have the application deadline on it. So we sent it out. And we're like, yes, like the application's launched, and we got like fifteen responses in like a minute that were like, what was the deadline for the application? And we were like, how did we miss that? Because it was something that we we knew what the what the deadline was, but obviously we need to be telling the students who are applying, what the deadline is. Um, and also just knowing your audience, know who you're speaking to, speak directly to the student um, and, and in a way that is compelling to them. Um, and then make sure that they have all of the information they need to be informed when you're marketing to them. And so what we have done is we have interns who work within the organization who are, who are still students or recently graduated students. So what we've started doing is running things by them, like just to speak to you, would you wanna participate on this? Is this visually appealing? Um, do you have everything that you need to know um, to be able to, to make a decision about this program um, or what we're offering? So we, we, we really try to utilize student-aged um, uh, reviewers to make sure that we're putting out the best, the best material. Thanks, Kendall. Um, I have made, I think, all of the mistakes everyone said already. But the last thing that I have learned uh, is, uh, I mentioned before the focus group that we did with student employees. And we just realized how um, little students actually understood about study abroad and what it actually meant. So since that realization a few years ago, we have worked really hard to focus our outreach on addressing this topic, um, which is essentially why we started doing class visits at all. Um, and when I do class visits with students, the first thing I do is ask students like, what does study abroad mean to you? And so many students say so many different kinds of things, but it helps me just have a better understanding of where we're starting so that I can guide students to actually appropriate, uh, correct information. Um, we also created a five minute intro to study abroad video because of this focus group where we learned that students just didn't know what study abroad was. So this video was created to provide a thorough in explanation of what study abroad means. And it has a lot of content from students. So rather than hearing me talk about my study abroad experience, you know, they're hearing firsthand from their peers. Um, and it's making, it, it's stopping the assumption that students understand what it is and why it's important, right? We're just making sure that everyone's starting from the same place. So again, let's just go through these best practices that we all have learned through experience. Um, photographs are subjective, so double and triple check that they are appropriate and that they are avoiding the use of cultural appropriation. As Jamie said, don't go it alone. 
work with students and other departments to develop programming and review materials, tailor your vocab to your audience. So avoiding those acronyms and internal language, age, excuse me, language, being honest with students about barriers, right? Or cost, things like that. So that we acknowledge that yes, this is something that you need to deal with, but we're here to provide support, providing explanations and something that we've started doing over the last few years in my office is use QR codes, which helps so much. Um, and then again, representation matters. Students should be able to see themselves in the shoes of another student uh, so that they feel like this is an opportunity for them. Okay, so final Zoom poll. Cindy, if you wouldn't mind um, initiating that poll. Again, this, is, this session is really meant to be collaborative and selfishly, I wanna hear from y'all, so please. Are there best practices that we're missing? If so, what are they? Looking forward to hearing what y'all have to say. Oops, Cindy, I think this might be the wrong poll. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I sorry. thought we already asked the one. I'm sorry, I am. Uh, I got the wrong one. My apologies. No problem. I may have miss said something. Um. Or we can just ask people to share in the chat. That might be easier. So I'll go back. So if y'all wanna just use the chat and tell us if there's any best practices that we're missing. Yes, Marissa, I think measuring effectiveness is something that a lot of us want to do and don't know really where to start or, um, I think it's hard to find the time to do an assessment, but so important to use data to figure out what's working and what's not working. Thank you. Talking about QR codes also. Yes, we use QR codes a lot, but you have to be careful. Yes, that they continue to work. Yes, including exchange students. If y'all have the, the capacity to do that, that's so helpful, agreed. Another resource to help students better understand what they'll be doing in country. You know, I think what I'd like to do everyone, if you wanna to continue to add in any other comments, feel free. I think I'm gonna let y'all have about uh, have five minutes um, of break and then we'll come back in five to, is that my phone ringing? I think it is, my phone never rings. <laughs> of course it's ringing on a Friday morning. Um, sorry. Lost my train of thought. Yeah, take five minutes. We'll see y'all back here at about 9.42 and we'll move into the critique of marketing materials. All right, everybody, welcome back. Uh, let's see here. So let's Zoom poll, I lied. <laughs> the last one was the last one. This is the last one. Um, the way that we'd like to start this critique of marketing materials portion is just to find out a little bit more about what you're doing or what your office um, supports in terms of marketing. And is there a marketing specific staff member in your department? Um, if not, who does this work and what level of training do they have? So let's initiate that poll. And I'm really interested to see what the answers are. All right, I think Looks like most people have voted in the poll and I don't think we need to share out, Cindy. I can see the results here. It looks like the overwhelming <laughs> uh, majority of us do not have a marketing specific staff member in, our, in their office. Um, looks like five do and 16 do not. So, um, I think that speaks volumes to, to everything that we've been talking about today. And I hope that helps y'all um, participate in the critique of marketing materials session with some grace for all of us, because again, we have not been trained in this, but it's a part of our job. And so learning from each other, I think is really important here. And Susie, yes, using students, 
students, students, students. I know those are, uh, without the students, I wouldn't be able to get the marketing and outreach uh, done that I do, especially the social media stuff that makes me feel uh, sort of like my grandma. <laughs> All right, so um, let me actually go back. So this is how this is gonna work. Y'all are gonna be assigned to breakout rooms for the next 20 minutes. And as you are placed into your breakout rooms, I ask that you choose someone in your room to be the note taker. And then you are going to use a separate document, which Cindy is gonna put the link to in the chat. Um, you're gonna be using that document to put your notes in so that we all can see each other's notes. So after you discuss the questions, please include that note taker will include their groups takeaways on the breakout notes page of the marketing material that you're looking at. So to avoid traffic jams, different groups are going to start on different marketing materials. So group one and two, you're going to start with the print material. Group three and four, you're going to start with the social media material. And group five, you are going to start with the video. Um, I hope that makes sense. I'm gonna say it one more time because I think it might be a little convoluted. So you're gonna get into your breakout rooms. You're gonna assign a note taker. As you discuss the questions, please start taking notes on your uh, marketing material note page. And to avoid a traffic jam, groups one and two will start with the print material. Groups three and four will start with the social media material and group five will start with the video. And I'm gonna put this in the chat. Just gonna copy and paste so you all know what I'm talking about. And then we'll come back uh, and discuss as a whole group. Okay, everybody, welcome back. <laughs> okay, everybody, welcome back. Um, firstly, I apologize for the technical difficulties. Um, I it, it seems like we got everything to work appropriately. So I'm sharing my screen. Y'all should be able to see my the the breakout room notes um so some things that we noticed as facilitators was that y'all have keen eyes this is not your first rodeo um i see a lot of themes around making sure that everything that we're including via instagram or in a flyer or in a video is inclusive i see some questions about what is the appropriate amount of content and um, I also noticed lots of people talking about the um, photos being used. So Megan and Jema had some interesting um, comments to add, if y'all wanna share, and then I'd like to hear what other people have to say. Jema, do you wanna go ahead? Oh, sure, sure. Um... I, in kind of looking over the notes, I um, one idea that popped into my head is making sure that as you approach, um, you know, a, a new uh, marketing tool, you know, identify what the goal is of this particular, whether it's a flyer video, what what one thing can't necessarily accomplish and share out every piece of information about a particular program or, um, uh, or location. So kind of identifying before you even get started, what, what's your primary goal? Who exactly are you trying to reach? Um, and, then, and then go from there in designing what it is. So, so it's not going to be a one size fits all, answers every single question for every single student. Uh, you may need to, to have a couple different versions for the different uh, demographics you're trying to reach out to. Yeah, absolutely. And I think to make sure that you have a layered portfolio of marketing items that's all stacked up to give the comprehensive picture. So maybe your, your first touch point is a big poster that just says the location and when it is, and it, that's gonna point you to another resource when students can really dig in, you know, obviously where a website might have all of the details, but a social media post 
it could be very specific, you know, a targeted aim and then a call to action of what to do next. So thinking about your whole portfolio um, in that context, I think will be helpful. Sorry. Um, does anybody from the breakout groups feel compelled to share anything that you noticed? or um, something that you might change to work in the context of your institution and the students that you serve. I'd love to hear it either via chat or if you wanna just unmute yourself. Yeah, um, I can talk a little about our group. Um, we looked at some of the videos and one of the things that we did notice is for um, some of the institutions that we work with, we have non-traditional aged students. And so some of these seemed to be really highlighting very youthful experiences, which is super great if your demographic at your university primarily is a traditional college age, you know, 18 to 22. But for those of us that might be working at a non-traditional um, school where we may have students like our average age is 27, um, some of these images might seem fun, but it might um, <laughs> not really attract our student attention necessarily. Um, and also the videos, the, you know, some of them felt like really fun, but the academic piece. And so it was mentioned by one of our group members that we're always trying to reiterate to students that this is actually a student academic experience. And so setting that and being clear from the very beginning of our interactions with them so that there's no misunderstandings when they do get abroad and there are expectations that they are in class, that they are, you know, working, you know, reading, um, doing academic experience rather than just like going sea kayaking and um, partying and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So thank you for um, saying that. They were super fun. And like the music was like a good vibe and all of that. But it's also, you know, making sure that people are clear that I'm signing up to actually go abroad and look at a, whatever topic it is, but from an academic lens through an academic thank lens. You. I think this critique is so helpful for us but it's also tricky because we are all coming with the knowledge of our particular student bodies. And as we've explained here, everyone is supporting so many different kinds of students. So the one size fits all method as Megan and Jima were also saying, just doesn't fit. So um, I hope that you found some things that will work, but then as you said, Alice, or at least I'm not sure how you say your name, um, Elise. Thank you, Elise. Sorry. As you said, Elise, like, you know that certain parts of this wouldn't work for your student body. So you know how to potentially market things with more mature students. Same with me. That's what something that I try really hard to do. Um, yes. Other, anybody else want to have a, a, a word to share about the breakout room? a request maybe yeah. possible um because i noticed if you go to the first one the flyer for the frederick douglas i see very proudly that one of our alums is represented so but he didn't go on the frederick douglas while at miami Dade. he transferred out to un and then uh that's when paul duyon participated in the frederick douglas it was at his transition so uh, it is hard for us because the number of students studying abroad while they are at the college, it's so minimal compared to late to universities. But if we could include that the student is attending that school but came from a deep, from a college, I think a lot of the students from the community college can see themselves represented because when they see, oh, that student studied abroad with UM, then that's not a community college in the other students' eyes. Right. So if it would be possible to include like their, their two institutions, graduation year, maybe something like that. Um, that's a shameless blog in advocating for community colleges. So I will I, I will respond to that because I know Paul, he's incredible. He's amazing. Uh, he's amazing. <laughs> he is he is wrapping up an internship with me now currently. And uh, and what and we students have participated on the fellowship who are community college students as well. So I would encourage anyone who works at a community college who has students who might be interested in the fellowship to let them know that it is 
for them as well. And, and, and when you think about marketing the program as well, like tell them, Paul came from Miami Day, like you can do this and encourage them to apply as well. Um, and, and, and that's something that we can think about as well it, when students apply, because it's obviously the university that they apply with, but asking, can we highlight other institutions that they've attended if they have as well? Because that, as, you, as you say, um, as you said rather, um, it, it is important for community college students to know that it is for them, and it is, so yeah. Especially because for us, we sometimes we do advocate for them and encourage them now, but that doesn't happen until later. And in my personal opinion, I'm all for it. Like as long as they go, it's great. But the idea is that they see themselves represented with the ones that went, right? I, see, I think you get my point. Yes, bringing, it's like what we talked about earlier, using students as a means to say, okay, look at this person who looks like you, who you identify with, or who you know they did it, you can do it too, right? Using students as a, re a living, breathing resource. Thank you, Gabrielle. That makes a lot of sense to me. Thanks. Anybody else have anything that they wanted to share? I think um, we will move on to the final portion today. Um, so let me share a different screen. Oh. Okay. Oh my goodness, my screen is small. Okay. So y'all, um, thank you so much for the discussion, the amazing ideas. Like I said, I have copious notes here that I've scribbled. I'd like to take the last little bit of time today to make sure that y'all have time to ask any questions or share out about anything related to marketing and outreach that you, you don't think we covered today or that you want to make sure that we do cover in the last few minutes. Um, I have some facilitation, excuse me, facilitation questions that I can put in the chat, but I'd prefer to start with just this blank slate and let people have at it. I'm not seeing anything come through the chat. So um, if I may, since no one has anything to add as of yet, I'd love personally to know more about ways people are using social media as a marketing tool. Um, if anybody has any tips or tricks or things that have worked or haven't worked, I think this is something that a lot of us maybe do on a personal level and are learning how to do professionally. And again, if you don't have training, in social media or marketing, I know at least for me, I'm always feeling like, is this appropriate or not? So if anybody has any thoughts, please feel free to share. Instagram takeover guidelines, Ramona, yes. Um, does anybody have any? <laughs> I know Ramona, I have some that I took from another institution, from another workshop that I did during COVID that I'd be happy to share. I just have to find them. Um, the way that we do Instagram takeovers, um, or rather the, we, we just get content from students and then post it on our Instagram rather than having them actually do it themselves. So we don't have to worry about the content, but that is more work for us. I will say something else that we've done recently um, is have faculty who are leading study abroad programs join our social media, our Instagram page and do a live Q&A so students can log in. And these are generally in the evening um, and join us. And again, um, if the content is less worrisome because you're working with a faculty member and then students can ask questions um, and the faculty prepare some statements. Um, and that has received decent attendance. And as I said before, I think uh, you can record these, right? We can record our live streams and Instagram and then you can upload them to the program website. So that content is just sitting there and I can always uh, tell interested students, like, did you look at the Instagram Q&A? There's an answer to your questions about hiking Machu Picchu or living with host families or whatever. Anybody else have any other Instagram related or social media related tips or questions? You're muted, Courtney. Thank you. 
I was just going to say, I, I, anybody have tips for Gabriella as an office of one? I don't know if you have the capacity to have interns or student employees, Gabriella, but I know that that saves, like I mentioned a million times that I, I tell students all the time, I can't do this work without you. Um, and especially with social media and doing things that young people are more fluent in, I find it really, really helpful and invigorating. I would also add what I, I typed in the chat earlier today was if you don't use something like Hootsuite to manage your social media posts, uh, I would definitely recommend it. There's a free version. You can, you can do like five posts in advance all at once. So if you just have one hour, you could sit down and kind of plan out one post per week for the whole month. And um, using Canva, which some folks talked about earlier, makes really beautiful graphics lots of templates, so you don't have to start from scratch. That's um, been a lifesaver for me. Although it's great to use, um, you know, student provided photos. Um, if you aren't able to, there are some sites where you can, if you're not already aware, where you can get really beautiful um, location specific photos. Um, my um, community relations department has, um, share their their go-to places for stock photos um and uh, i can put a couple of those in the chat just so you have the links to those um sites that that i use when i don't have photos for everything that i want to promote thank you Dana. that is always the trouble searching for photos when you've never had a program run before um and these are free photos that um uh no copyright uh situation that you have to run into thank you um, with that, y'all, I think we're going to go into the closing and assignment of tasks slide. So, Jeff, take it away. Thank you. Uh, thank you again to all of our presenters and facilitators today. Uh, what a, a great session. So uh, it is my job to uh, queue us up for the follow up session, which is in about a month. Um, we really hope that you will join us for this session. It's really an opportunity to uh, reconnect and, and continue building community. Um, before I talk about the specifics of that, I do want to uh, mention, and uh, Cindy will put in the chat and we'll send an email later, uh, two things. One is uh, the feedback form for this specific session. Thank you to those who have been filling those out uh, throughout the sessions. We really appreciate that feedback. Um, and we'll be engaging with that feedback in the follow-up, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, in addition, in response to the request to build community and have an opportunity for us to engage with one another beyond these sessions, uh, we've created a contact form survey. So if you are interested in um, sort of being part of a, a contact list that we'll share with the, the folks who fill out that form, please go ahead and fill out that form. It asks some questions, including your contact information and permission to share with others within the, the workshop series. So as I mentioned, our follow-up meeting is on June 24th, and it's really an opportunity for us to reconnect around the lessons that we've been learning together and the knowledge we've been generating together throughout this past month. Um, and so it'll be broken up into a series of, of subsections. So we'll hear again from our, our colleagues at, at Ideas and World Learning to uh, help us think about what we've learned and, and some of their future plans for workshops. Uh, we'll do some uh, exercises around re-entry programming and supporting students upon their return from study abroad programs, which is really exciting. Uh, we'll have an opportunity to reflect on the feedback and, and uh, do some additional feedback collection uh, and small focus groups during the, the follow-up. And then finally, we're going to uh, hopefully have some examples of um, initiatives that you're hoping to develop out of some of the learning that we did. So we've provided some, uh, some handout uh, and instructions for that. Um, but in, a, in essence, we'd, we'd love for you to reflect on your learning throughout the workshop series and draw on the handouts and homeworks and institutional data that you uh, developed and materials from all of the sessions um, to think about one or more initiatives that you might uh, implement at your institutional organization that's aimed at recruiting and supporting historically marginalized students or expanding access and inclusion and in study abroad programming at your institution or organization. For instance, you might want to develop an initiative around um, a lesson plan to support program directors design of inclusive study abroad and learning environments, uh, maybe an institutionally appropriate outreach and marketing plan that grew out of the discussion today. 
uh, perhaps a framework for building uh, 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 community partnerships or institutional partnerships to support study abroad programming. Um, so any of these kinds of initiatives, we'd love for you to think through what they might look like on your campus or at your institution or organization. Uh, and we've provided, like I said, a handout to help you kind of work through the steps to do that. Uh, and hopefully have some folks share those with us uh, at the follow-up session in June. So thank you again for being here and for sticking with us through a month of, of really engaging sessions. And we look forward to seeing you on the 24th. Thank you all so much. Thank you.